video. I'm not 100% sure what gets recorded. I believe the chats do not get recorded. Right. Say one more time, welcome. Thank you very much for coming and joining us uh, this evening to learn a little bit about the PhD program here at the Faculty of Information. Uh, before we get much further, I wanted to uh, uh, acknowledge uh, the traditional lands. We wish to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Uh, next slide. So the way that we are going to operate today is we are going to take about 10 minutes to introduce all the folks that are going to be speaking uh, with you today. Uh, so we'll walk through each one of those. Then I will talk briefly about the program and kind of how it's uh, set up and structured. Then we will move into a faculty and student panel and discussion. Uh, this will primarily focus on uh, uh, the faculty members because uh, the students uh, will, the current and recently graduated PhD students will uh, have a separate panel uh, towards the end. However, the students are more than welcome to chime in uh, as appropriate during that first little slot there. Uh, after that uh, first panel, uh, the uh, we will have Sherry talk through the admissions process. Sherry Dang or Sherry Le Sherry Dang will talk through the admissions process, and then the faculty members will all leave, and we will put Haley Bryant in charge. And uh, Haley's uh, uh, the president of the Doctoral Student Association, so she will be in charge of the session, and we will leave. I believe we will turn off the recording button, and uh, you can speak to the PhD students without us, uh, without faculty members. All right. Um, I will point out that uh, Andrea and Christine are monitoring the, the channel in the background. So please uh, post your questions there and we will use them uh, and, and save them for the appropriate moment. So please feel free to immediately start posting those questions. There's kind of not a whole lot of reason to wait. All right. So without further ado, let's uh, move to the next slide and do some introductions. Oh, myself. OK, sorry, I guess I should talk about myself. Uh, my name is Tony Tang. I'm an associate professor here at the University of Toronto. I'm currently the associate dean of research, and I serve as a doctoral program director here. And uh, my research is focused on user experience design and human-computer interaction. Uh, I was originally trained as a computer scientist, so I have a, a, sl a slightly more technical bent than uh, many of our colleagues. Uh, Andrea, could we move to the faculty panel slide just for a moment, just so we have those faces that we can that we can speak to? Um, I'm going to have a couple more slides forward. I think I'm going to have uh, Sarah. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah Sharma. Um, I'm an associate professor at the Faculty of Information and also the ICCIT, which is at UTM. And I'm also the director of the McLuhan Center for Culture and Technology. So that's all I'll say for now. We get one minute each. I <laughs> Thanks. Uh, then I'll turn it over to Castice. Hi, everyone. My name is Costis Dallas. I'm also an associate professor with the Faculty of Information. I teach in the Museum Studies program, and uh, my research is on practice studies. I'm interested in uh, qualitative research. I'm supervising dissertations uh, on archaeological practices in the field, on uh, Chinese uh, contemporary art curators and their communication uh, uh, practices, uh, on uh, Instagram photography in uh, memorial sites, uh, and also on uh, material semiotics uh, in museum exhibition labels. Excellent. Thank you. We also have Patrick Kilty, who should be joining us, but he's not here right now, so I'll wait uh, for him to introduce himself when he shows. Uh, could you slide one more slide in, Andrea, for us? And we'll have the doctoral students introduce themselves. Haley, please. Sorry, it takes a second for the video to catch up. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Haley Bryant. Uh, I'm a second year doctoral student and 
the iSchool. Um, I uh, am a, a scholar of settler descent from America originally. Um, I'm in my home office right now uh, where we all are some version of and I'm wearing a leopard print sweater and I have brown and blue hair, wearing glasses. Um, and uh, my research focuses on the application of emerging technologies for cultural recuperation work in the Great Lakes region. Um, I uh, study under uh, Professor Kara Krampadich, and uh, my research is a part of the Great Lakes Research Alliance for the Study of Aboriginal Arts and Culture, or GRASAC, which is a mouthful. Um, I'm also president of the Doctoral Student Association for this academic year, and I work uh, closely with the a QP union, which represents teaching assistants uh, at the University of Toronto. Um, so I can answer questions across a broad range of topics. Um, and I'm happy to be here with you all tonight. Thanks very much, Haley. Ellen. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ellen. I am a first year PhD student. Along with the iSchool, I'm also part of the Book History and Print Culture program, um, so I can answer any questions related to that program as well as the iSchool. Uh, I study with um, Dr. Alan Gailey, and my research focuses on the publishing history of speculative fiction genres in Canada, digital publishing, small press publishing, and accessibility in publishing. Thank you. Zia? Good evening, everyone. My name is Zia. Uh, I recently completed my PhD from the Faculty of Information. I graduated just a few months ago. Well, I haven't technically graduated. That happens at the convocation. But yes, I have defended and I, I have defended my thesis. Uh, I prior to the high school, I did, got an MBA from uh, Schulich School of Business. So I have, a, I have that background. But my undergrad and grad were in engineering as well. I have a BS and MS in engineering. So I do come from a technical background, but I understand a little bit of business as well. My research interests are in the design of information systems as they happen in organizations in large scale enterprises due to disruptive and emerging digital technologies. Thank you very much, Zia. Uh, can I turn it over to Jack? Uh, yeah, so uh, so my name is Jack Jamison. Um, uh, like Zia, I've just recently uh, defended. Uh, my research is uh, about understanding how to design uh, information technologies that reflect their creators' values, uh, especially uh, things like alternative social media. I focused on in my dissertation. Um, so uh, I'm you know delighted to talk about that sort of thing. Uh, really looking at if, if one sets out how to build an ethical technology, how do you account for all the kinds of moving parts uh, uh, of working with other people and interoperating systems, et cetera. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you very much. If we could slide back a couple slides, Andrea. Uh, so uh, that hopefully gives you a really brief introduction to the folks that we have in our program uh, uh, that are here, sorry, representing the program today. Uh, you can hear already that there is a wide variety of interests and a wide variety of uh, 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 things that people do. They take different methodological approaches. Uh, they study different domains and stuff like this. We are the first and oldest PhD program in information studies here in Canada. We are, of course, uh, at the University of Toronto, which is uh, ranked uh, uh, number one uh, in Canada. And I believe our program, or either our program or the university is ranked 21st in the world. We have a large alumni network of 7,000 plus grads, and we are the fastest growing faculty at the University of Toronto. Our PhD complement right now uh, is uh, 55 plus students. So you're joining uh, a relatively healthy uh, a group of PhD students, all of whom are engaged in uh, information studies and research in those spaces. If we slide to the next slide here, uh, one of the interesting things about our program is that we have a number of collaborative specializations. Um, I, Castis, do you want to speak to this, or I can I can kind of uh, sort of read the slide um, quickly, unless Castis wants to jump in. Um, but essentially. Uh, 
students can take a PhD here and also engage in a collaborative specialization at the same time to sort of enrich uh, their, 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 their understanding and background in an interdisciplinary way. Um, Ellen uh, is one of these people who is engaged in a PhD here and also doing collaborative specialization in book history and print culture. Uh, often these are sort of partner relationships that we have with organizations within the University of Toronto. Um, where you kind of take an extra set of courses or you kind of fold that in as part of your program and you get that sort of disciplinary background. It also exposes you, of course, to folks that are interested in research in that space and uh, helps you to build your network in that way. If we turn our attention then to uh, the specific fields of study that we have, um, we have a couple of slides here or three slides here that show you kind of the range of things that we do, and you'll see a bunch of names in here as well. And I want to make it clear that the list does not represent all the faculty in every field of study. Um, I recommend you to visit uh, the website to see some of the other faculty files. And what we will often find is that our students um, don't necessarily, they're not necessarily in one of these sort of buckets. Uh, they will often find people in different buckets to work with uh, in ways that match their uh, specific needs and interests in their research space. Um, really briefly, for each of these uh, right here, uh, archives and record, records management is really about uh, the social, cultural, institution, and technological practices associated with the creation, uh, use uh, of recorded information. Uh, critical information policy studies uh, is really about that critical analysis of all the social, technical, and uh, political, and economic, and uh, assumptions and implications uh, that these policies have on citizens, workers, and consumers of information systems. Cultural heritage is uh, it's a multidisciplinary field that focuses on cultural memory, representation, identity, and ethics um, in a technologically mediated world. The media technology and culture concentration uh, draws on historical, critical theoretical, human interactionist, sociological, political and economic, and psychological modes of inquiry. It's our sort of a field of study that's been put in place. The next slide, we also have uh, folks that are interested in knowledge management and information management. Uh, here, uh, they focus on uh, concepts, tools, and practices that enable systematic, imaginative, and responsible management of information in an organization or community. And uh, I'll point out here, Aviv is uh, cross-appointed. Oh, nuts. I forgot where he's cross-appointed. Uh, anybody on the faculty really want to help me quickly? I believe he's cross-appointed with public health. health. Policy and evaluation management. Management yeah. and evaluation. Thank you, Christine. Um, so he does he does this work in the context of health systems, right? So here's an example of uh, some of that cross-disciplinary stuff that happens. We also, of course, have a, a long history with library and information science. And here it's about humanistic perspectives and approaches to the study of information services. Uh, uh, given that social change and global transition is happening, we have a bunch of folks that are interested in philosophy information, which explores the foundational concepts and principles and theories applicable to information practices of all sorts. Uh, then we have people that are interested in information systems and design, and that's um, uh, that's that uh, innovative and imaginative design and use of media and information systems, uh, particularly as it rates, relates to the digital revolution that we're firmly engaged in. And they approach this from a humanistic angle. Uh, in the next slide, we've got a couple of sort of new areas that uh, are not formalized as fields of study yet, uh, but they do represent a growing interest in our faculty. One is on human-centered data science. And this is the design of algorithms and technologies for studying and incorporating insights gathered from data at scale uh, with a clear understanding of human-centered problems and issues. And then finally, user experience design and human-computer interaction. And here, we explore the design and uh, evaluation of new technologies, studying new ways of interacting with people and information, and exploring that balance between uh, eff efficacy and the needs of people. So this is kind of a long-winded way of talking through all of the things that we do at our faculty uh, in terms of research. Uh, as I said earlier, 
one of the really neat things about our PhD program and students that work through that PhD program um, is that they can engage with uh, people from all of these different disciplines. And often in supervisory committees, we see that they're comprised of people from across, uh, across these fields of study. Um, I think there are a couple of things I probably should have mentioned. I'll just mention them super briefly. Our program is a four-year program. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a centrally funded program primarily uh, where you have full funding through the four years. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, a PhD is a real journey. It's good times, uh, good times and, uh, and uh, challenging times as well. It's a full-time program, yes. Okay, I will turn it over to uh, the panel right now. I see that uh, Patrick has just joined us. So, um, Patrick, I see that you're here. Uh, I just want to give you a quick moment to introduce yourself uh, really quickly. I want to just test your mic there. Yes, I, sorry, I apologize. Should I do my no introduction? Yes, please. Um, so, hi, my name is Patrick Kilty. I will try to get my video to work in a moment. Um, I apologize for being late. Um, I was on another call, but my uh, research relates to um, uh, sort of gender, sexuality, and technology, ethnography of technology, um, and I also occasionally write on libraries and archives, um, and I run a one of many digital humanities projects here at the university. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Yes, uh, so I will turn our attention to the faculty panel. And again, students uh, that are on the panel, if you want to jump in, uh, you are more than welcome to do so. Um, so we have a, a, a couple of sort of, um, I don't know what you want to call, canned questions that we have for the panel. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, please post questions uh, for the panel into the chat. Uh, we are interested to uh, make sure that we're addressing uh, all of the questions that you have uh, at the at the right times. Um, Sarah, if it's okay, if I can start with you, um, maybe I can ask you about uh, your favorite part about doing research and teaching uh, uh, in the Faculty of Information. Yeah, I realized that when I introduced myself, I didn't say anything about my research or anything, so I <laughs> yeah. Oh, good. Um, Yes. Well, and also my favorite part about researching um, and teaching in the Faculty of Information is probably the work I get to do at the McLuhan Center, which has largely um, also been a home for a lot of the work that's done in MTC, the Media Technology Culture um, Concentration. And so one of the things I love about this is it's a pretty cutting edge space in terms of we're able to bring in, um, this year it's a little different, but still, it's um, a center that's um, it's really much, very much devoted to critical and cultural and radical approaches to technology in the same vein that McLuhan would have been in. It was his old center in the 60s. So I, for this, I find, um, yeah, I think this is an exciting, it's an exciting place to do media studies now in a way that maybe it wasn't many years ago. And I think as Tony pointed out, it's a sort of emerging area in the department um, and it's a well-supported one. So I guess, that would be my favorite thing. I feel like we get to be at the forefront of something um, with the center and with all the faculty and students involved. And I think Patrick will um, attest to this too. It became a space and it is a space where a lot of our PhD students found connections um, with other students, but also with faculty you run into people there that you realize you have the same common interests. And there are other research institutes at the Faculty of Information that sort of have that same quality. So I think, you know, it seems like a big program in some ways, but you tend to, if you stay engaged, uh, you tend to have your curiosity peaked and also satiated in these various ways. So that would probably be the best way I could put it. Thank you. That's excellent. I'm going to uh, turn this over to Castice and perhaps ask a similar or related question. Um, certainly, um, you can answer the favorite part about uh, researching and teaching in the Faculty of Information, but perhaps you can also speak to um, the uh, diversity of the, 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 the research practice that, that people engage in as well. Castice. Yeah, thanks. And uh, if, if I may, I'm going to refer also to something that sometimes we 
uh, need to get in these applications in order to be able to evaluate students. Everyone is able from the applications that we see to assess themselves and to present a, an idea for a research uh, project and uh, outline this and outline one area of research. Something that we don't see always is really the way in which applicants also connect uh, with the interests uh, and the profiles of people who they might be working with in the faculty. And we have a lot of diversity here in this because we've got people that uh, might work uh, uh, with systems uh, and uh, information systems and design on the one end. We've got more technical people whose work are interested, is really engaging with uh, uh, the specifics of uh, different kinds of uh, information systems and infrastructures. And then we get other people who really work very, very much focusing on people, right? Uh, and how people interact and work with information. And finally, we've got also people who work uh, very, very much with the artifacts of uh, information, with actual data, and how data is constituted, how information itself is constituted from different perspectives. And it's very diverse, really. And I think we, we want to see that. For instance, uh, from my point of view, uh, I'd be interested to hear of uh, people who who would like to work, uh, let's say, uh, on questions that have to do with uh, the construction of memory or identity uh, through practices of heritage. Broadly speaking, cultural heritage is a very broad phenomenon. I've got colleagues in the museum studies uh, crowd who work, for instance, uh, with uh, food and the importance of food as material culture itself, or in the way in which food also shapes institutional practices in museums. I've got other colleagues who work very much with the context of the ethics of care uh, with indigenous communities and in relation to what uh, Again, you know, worlds that are institutional, such as the world of music, can do to somehow sort of address all these questions of inequity and exclusion that goes sometimes with all these uh, communities. So it's very broad. And uh, what we want to hear is people who have researched us a little and who know not just one person, but maybe two or three of us, you know, because again, as we assess these applications, we want to see that people uh, are supported not just by one person. Sometimes, you know, relationships turn south. And uh, we want to know that there's a cohort of us that can support uh, uh, one of you guys if you decide to join the program and if we accept you. So this, this is more or less what I want to say. And uh, I'll come back later with uh, uh, responses to other questions. Thank you, Tony. Thanks. Um, I'll turn it over to Patrick at this point and uh, just to kind of follow up a little bit on uh, Castice's last point there and uh, perhaps Olivia's question. Patrick, I'll ask you, um, when you have been uh, reading applications, when you have been thinking about taking on students, what are some of the kinds of things that got you really, really excited about a student uh, that uh, that made you want to sort of champion that application? Well, I'm interested to see that um, they have a good fit within the program. So I want to see that they've sort of done their research about the program, that they are applying to us with a particular sort of um, research agenda in mind that fits our faculty um, um, or that they can see themselves sitting in here. And so they're not just randomly applying to different programs and trying to get in anywhere, but that they've crafted an application um, um, that, that speaks to the strengths of what we do in the Faculty of Information. And I'm also, at the same time, um, and I don't know if all of my colleagues would agree with this, but I'm not, I don't, I don't put a huge emphasis on you having a completely formed project right from the beginning. I hope that there will be some kind of intellectual development over the course of the PhD. Um, I hope that there will be some kind of um, shift in the kinds of things that interest you um, as you become more excited about uh, things you encounter in graduate school. And so I need you to have some sense of direction um, when you apply to the program. But I also um, mostly put an emphasis on fit and um, and your ability to sort of um, develop uh, intellectually and research-wise once you get here. Can I just add one more thing, Tony? It's also helpful to see that um, students are able to do research independently and have good writing skills. Um, I don't know if that's true of all of our uh, dissertations, but I know that the dissertations I supervise, at the end of the day, it's a big written document. So you're going to need to um, have excellent writing skills and the ability to work independently, make your own deadlines. Um, the further you move into a PhD program, the less structured it becomes. 
and the more you have to set your own deadlines and meet. So. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. I'm going to turn it over to Sarah so you can see I'm sort of doing a, uh, a round <laughs> once through and around again. Um, Sarah, I, you're free to take this uh, which, whatever direction makes sense for you. Um, but the question uh, to sort of follow up on Patrick's comment there is I'm curious, in what ways have the students you've been working with grown and changed? And uh, perhaps more mechanically, are students held to the proposed work that they outline in their application? Do they have to do uh, that proposed project? Yeah, this is a really good question. I should say I've um, supervised seven PhD students to completion and five or have tenure track jobs. I was at a different department before. I currently have three PhD students right now. Um, and so one of the things I would say, I completely agree with what Patrick just mentioned as well, about sometimes a research statement, um, it doesn't have to be completely narrowed down and something that you have to hold yourself to. For me, it's like, do you have a research question? Do you have like, is there a question that you're looking to answer? And then how would the people in our faculty have the expertise to help you answer that? So I think that also speaks to what Costis said about being able to know the department that you're applying to, because quite often, your project might change along the way. Um, your advisor might change. Your committee members might change. So I think um, having a, like having a research question that sort of allows us to see where you're coming from intellectually and where your curiosities lie and how we can serve that is another way of thinking about your project. And I'll, because that also allows you to recognize there's room in our department for you or in our faculty sorry, for you to change. Um, and my, like think let's say, I, so I think that should be something um, I think that's that's sort of an intellectual matter but that's also another question that Tony had asked us to think about was what sort of traits and habits uh, make for a good PhD student and and I was going to say that well Patrick said it was about being independent as well but um, being open to that sort of change it might come at you theoretically it might be methodological change um, so I think when you have certain things that you're asking about the world that you're researching, um, being open to that change and recognizing it as something positive and part of the process might also, I'm trying to say things that don't give you so much anxiety about the process, but um, being open to, to that change and movement I think is pretty good. So it's a good trait to have. So yeah, don't, don't, I, for me personally, it's like not to have such a narrow research state that there's no room for you. Um, I hope that helps, Tony. Yeah. Um, I, something to just to pick up on really quickly. Uh, oh, actually, if it's okay, I'm going to call on Asa, who put up her hand, uh, put up their hand, which is great. Uh, BB Collaborate allows us to do that. Asa, if you want to unmute, you're welcome to ask the question of the panel. Um. So hi, thank you, Tony. Um, really appreciate it, and hi everyone. Uh, um. It's really nice to hear so much about the program. Thank you for facilitating this. Um, I guess one question that I had um, was for the specialized, the collaborative specializations um, who host this. And sorry, I don't know if I can say your name properly. And you spoke already about it. I was just wondering, um, is the like I understand that the like I, I'm not really sure if I understand how the collaborations work I guess if you could maybe provide like an example um, of a research um, that was done let's say because I saw like um, one of the um, one of the collaborations is with, is with a topic such as like environmental sciences and I was wondering how these um, collaborations work like what would be the ratio of like how you would be focusing and let's say specifically information studies and then um, environmental science, perhaps. Yeah, can I take that, Tony? Absolutely, yeah, perfect, perfect yeah, okay, ordering. I'm, I'm like supposed I to be also a coordinator of the organization, so that that's comes up up my alley. But at the same time, I'm also the liaison. Each, each collaborative socialization has got a liaison, one person in the faculty that really deals with students in that one. And help students to somehow sort of benefit from that specializations. So specializations are like annotations, really. I mean, to give an example, I mean, one of my students, uh, Tori Abo, is working on uh, Instagram photography in the Memorial of the Murdered Jews in Berlin. So she connected and she enrolled in the collaborative socialization on Jewish studies. 
which incidentally is one also that offers some financial support as well uh, to some of the students. So she had to take courses in order to be able to fulfill the requirements of that specialization that really enabled her to understand better, to have a background, a better background on, let's say, Holocaust studies that are relevant to that uh, topic. And each specialization would come with such requirements. So you'd really need to take most typically one graduate seminar uh, course that is organized by that specialization. The same happens with uh, environmental uh, studies, where, for instance, another student uh, did a master's thesis at the time uh, under the, with the help of uh, uh, faculty in uh, uh, members in our faculty and the uh, coordinator of that specialization, the, the liaison, uh, Christoph Baker, uh, helped her, you know, sort of associate with the people who run that one and engage with frameworks uh, in that particular uh, area of study. So typically it means really fulfilling some additional requirements, but also benefiting from members of uh, uh, faculty that might belong to different departments or different faculties. Uh, for instance, Tori's got uh, Louis Kaplan, who's uh, a colleague on photography, who's associated to the Jewish studies uh, uh, center here in the University of Toronto, and the same happens in all of uh, uh, them. So if you're interested in that, I mean, then we sort of get you in touch with uh, uh, people who work on that one. In some cases, we do accept uh, uh, students, even if the collaborative specialization is not listed in our uh, roster, for special purposes, if a faculty member from our faculty feels uh, competent enough in order to uh, help them in that direction and liaise with that particular faculty. So please reach out when time comes and uh, we'll, you know, we're happy to help you in that uh, direction as well. Thank you. Hopefully that answers your question, Asa. I am realizing in this moment that I totally forgot to introduce uh, three people that uh, they didn't put their pictures in, so I forgot to do this. So I apologize. I'm going to, uh, but Sherry tells me that she will introduce the three of them. But really quickly, I wanted to uh, introduce Andrea, uh, who has been uh, cr crucial in sort of organizing and putting this thing together. Uh, Christine Chan is also on the call, who um, is sort of the main person that makes sure administratively the program works. And then Sherry, who's uh, uh, on our registrar team, who kind of uh, takes care of and handles uh, admissions uh, with us. So you will hear from them more, but uh, understand that they're here in the call as well. So I apologize uh, for missing out on the three of you. So sorry about that. I want to, uh, so thanks for that question about collaborative specialization and that response, Gustis. I wanted to follow up on something that Sarah, uh, Sarah talked about and essentially the idea of interesting research questions and thinking about and understanding what an interesting research question is. And I'm gonna put Patrick a little bit on the spot here and perhaps ask you about maybe your own journey or maybe the journey of some of your students as they've kind of come to um, develop good research questions and interesting research questions. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> let's see, from, from back when I was a PhD student, I mean, I have to say, I was really inspired by a lot of the coursework I took. Um, and um, it, it really depends on the kind of work you want to do. For me, it was about, you know, being accountable to particular communities. And so my research questions were really rooted in that. Um, but um, I can imagine it be, I mean, you know, for me, it was about trying to understand certain kinds of um, ways in which people were grappling with um, a kind of alternative tech culture. But that's not where my research began. I mean, it kind of wound up there. I think, gosh, early on, I wanted to do policy work, which if anybody knows me, that would be that's a kind of surprising thing to reveal. And my application when I was a PhD student was to do policy work. I'd lived in Washington, DC for a number of years. I had lobbied on those issues. I totally thought that's where I was going with my life. And when I got to graduate school, I took a bunch of amazing classes that opened my eyes to um, things that had always animated my interests. But um, I was able to ask questions that weren't necessarily policy oriented, but were community oriented, nevertheless. And um, and so that's that was one development. My students, um, I mean, like I said, every student that comes in, their project shifts usually. And a lot of it has to do with the readings from their courses. It has to do with events that they attend. Um, it has to do with um, being inspired by their fellow peers and their cohort and other students throughout the university. Um, so I think 
I mean, for me, those early days in graduate school are really about exploration and leaving yourself open to different approaches. I also found that even though my dissertation project was a humanities-based one, I took a ton of social science research classes, methods classes, um, and they would end up becoming incredibly useful later. And I, 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 it was useful in being able to do the translation work between the humanities and social sciences. And um, uh, I, I, I learned a lot from some of the politics that are and the sort of issues and critical pressure points that they've taken up in anthropology and trying to rethink how they might work in um, sort of uh, humanities-based methods. And I think that that has that was really helpful for me in terms of not just developing a question, but how to how to go about and like how to go about creating a method to answer those questions. Um, so I don't know if that was useful or, um, but I can say that everybody sort of starts in one place, I think, and evolves. And um, and I think it's about just letting yourself be receptive in those early days. And developing a research, good research question, you know, you start um, with a draft and you refine it um, over time. And so that also is a process about um, trying to get something that is both um, committed to the kinds of goals you want to accomplish specific enough that it's not this massive grand sweeping project it's not doable as a dissertation um and um that that gives you a sort of um clear um a sort of clear goal in mind um so i don't know if that's helpful but. great thanks i i think I mean, thinking about research questions, I think, is one of the things that we try to do. And uh, I think we learn over time how to develop good research questions and how to refine them. Um, just in reference, perhaps, to this notion of journeys and uh, uh, to the place that they uh, that these students may be doing their PhDs, uh, a question for uh, Sarah here. Um, You've seen several PhD students' journeys as they've gone through their process. And I'm curious, uh, two sort of two questions. Um, the first is, and you can choose to answer one or both or neither. Um, what catches your eye when you consider applicants? And secondly, uh, beyond simply doing research and taking courses, what makes being part of our community an interesting and powerful part of their journey? Um. I'll start with your second one and see if I get to the first one. Um, I think being, um, I think one of the exciting things that you, it's not just about the Faculty of Information, it's probably also being at U of T and being in Toronto and hopefully you can be here doing things <laughs> next year or the year after, um, or certainly somewhere in your four-year journey. Um, but I think it's that it usually, it's like a place, it's a great place to do all sorts of types of research. I think that's also what, when Costis was sort of talking about the different um, types of people we have in the Faculty of Information, the university has them too, and so does the city. And so I find like somebody who, um, I find like it's the best place to be curious, like a PhD program is the best way to explore and have this time in your life <clears throat> to explore and read and read a lot. You'll never get that time again. And I also think what's interesting is even these, the processes within a PhD program, like doing your qualitative exam or even writing your research statement, these are things you don't do over and over again. They're almost like you do them once, but they lead to something else. And so I think it's, um, I think I'm veering off of your question, Tony, but I think um, you can have your, um, yeah, you won't get that time again, as Patrick just said. And so I think there's a way of enjoying that. And as scary as it is, it's like an amazing time as well. Um, and so what catches my eye when I'm reading a research statement is probably... Can I just pause you for a sec there, Sarah? I, I wanted, uh, could you speak to some of the things that McLuhan Center does that can be part of a, a person's kind of experience of being at the University of Toronto? Yeah, well, one of the um, things that happens, has happened a lot is getting to meet people, like getting to meet, um, this year we're doing online meet the author events, and but it's also getting to meet, like field defining people in your area and having a chance to chat with them. And we're trying to recreate that with these virtual events. But I think, um, and also, I think one of the exciting things is having people come in. Like it could be a favorite author of your of the last article or book you read, and they'll talk to you about a new project they're working on. So it's, I think, being uh, at the forefront of, of cutting edge research in that way. And also, like, in a, in a space of where um, so it's also sort of 
it's sort of fun to talk with scholars while they're mid-process rather than they're completely refined. And um, so I think that's one thing that happens a lot, and I think that's one thing to take advantage of and that you maybe wouldn't find somewhere else. Um, Tony, did you want me to answer the other one, or do you want to move on? Why don't you take it too, if, if, it, if, it, if it makes you excited? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I feel like I read so many research statements, and I can, I can tell when the research statement is true, Does that, if, if that makes sense. Like, I can tell when the research statement is a, like an expression of something you actually want to do or that you're actually curious about versus a research statement that you think that maybe you've written um, because you think this is the way to write a research statement. So I think, um, and when Patrick said you write it and you write it again and again um, and you refine it, I think well, also another way to put this is truly like write something that is true about what you are interested in and because that would actually be the most interesting thing for all of us to um, read about and it doesn't have to be I mean obviously I, it, I you can tell by the questions somebody's asking um, what what they're motivated by and what they've read already and the sort of theoretical questions they have and sort of their interest in methodology you can read all those things between the lines of someone's research curiosities so I would say like to be to that um, and yeah, and don't see yourself as just um, replicating modes of scholarship elsewhere. I think it's a chance for you to put yourself out there. And you're probably doing something creative and innovative in your own mind, and you don't realize it. So I think it's a be okay to take a risk in your proposing of a research question. And probably get comfortable with risk um, for the rest of your life. <laughs> so, anyway. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Castice and sort of follow up on this thread about these research statements. Sorry, I'm kind of bouncing all over the place, but I'm thinking about like, what would I want to hear about uh, if I were a prospective student? So Castice, maybe one more question for you. And actually, this is posed by, I lost it in the thread. I think it's from Maria. And she asks um, two questions uh, as related to this research statement. So first, how technical should those research statements be in the sense that do we, does should it draw on research models and talk about those? Um, secondly, um, should it be broad or should it be very, very niche? Thank, thank you, Tony. Uh, thank you, Maria, as well, for the questions. That's, that's a very good question, actually. It depends very much, and I think we like to see specificity sometimes. And uh, some research projects and some minds, you know, some people, some applicants would come with a very concrete idea of uh, how to structure something that is a, an interest of them into something that is a question that might have also an idea of uh, what method and what approach, what methodological approach, what framework to integrate with that. And we'd like to see this being concrete sometimes without necessarily being just uh, uh, you know a list of preferences we don't want you know name dropping all over the place but it's good to be concrete in some cases however what i wanted to say is that this is a very diverse faculty so that means that some projects would not even come with the equivalent of a concrete research question per se in the way in which we understand it methodologically they might come with an interest in a topic and still they would be able to articulate an interest and an approach that is meaningful and that might be consequential to that. So there's a variety of, of uh, things like that. And actually, one of the things to say, I think, is that uh, uh, you will be expecting to grow in the faculty and in the program. One of the major things that this program is distinguished for, I think, is the strong preparation that we work with the students in the first couple of years. We benefit from faculty that is very diverse and very strong in the, our three campuses, people like Sarah Sharma, for instance, uh, from uh, the uh, Mississauga campus, and people like uh, David Nieberg, T.L. Cowan, from, and others, uh, 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 from uh, Kenzie Burchell and others from uh, from the Scarborough campus. So it's a broad really faculty that really contributes to a strong teaching program in the first couple of years. Methodologically, yeah, we work. I mean, this year, for instance, the methodology course is taught by Jeffrey Bose, one of the sort of internationally sort of big, big names in the area of uh, the sociology of uh, networks. Uh, uh, T.L. Cowan has been teaching a course which really looks into uh, aspects of intersectional uh, uh, research in, in methodology as well. So she looks at uh, feminist, uh, LGBTQ, and other intersectional approaches and how this shaped research 
Uh, I taught the uh, research uh, um, frameworks course last year, and I was focusing on trying to see what aspects of epistemology, methodology, axiology, uh, and ontology go into a research project working with students so that they develop their own ideas in their first year of studies. So I've got a diversity of things, and you will grow with that. Kara Krimpotic, my colleague, has been teaching, let's say, the theory course uh, uh, last year and previous year, in which she was working on books and full works, dissertations and books, and she would be looking at the book at a, every week, in which people would associate more pragmatically with what constitutes a good research project that is the length of the monograph, in a sense. It should present a diversity of approaches. So I think uh, I wanted to, to make this point really. And final thing I wanted to say, because it was a question by Iago that uh, I didn't really um, address when you asked me before, Tony. Sorry about that. It's about the diversity of students and the student population. Some of us come from different places, but it's also students that come from different backgrounds and places. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, Natalia Taronchuk, who's working with me now, uh, she's had a, a, a master's degree in uh, museum st and gallery studies from the University of Glasgow, and she's American, right? And uh, I remember uh, uh, Asen Ivanov. He came from Bulgaria, he worked in Amsterdam, with a team of media studies in Amsterdam, very, very strong team there. And then he came here and he, then our students, when they come from these diverse backgrounds, and now, of course, uh, Asen now is uh, a postdoctoral fellow with the University of uh, Wealth. And these people would be also be engaged with the community. Asen created, for instance, a chapter of the archivists uh, um, Association uh, for students here in the University of Toronto. My student uh, uh, now, Zach Baptiste, has set up a, a group of people in which it creates this beautiful and very, very interesting seminars with the Archaeology Center because it's also an archaeology. And some of you would come with very diverse backgrounds as well. So he was an archaeologist, other people come from media studies, from cultural studies, from philology and English. So we've got a very diverse uh, set of students as well. And this is one of the strengths of the faculty, really. Okay, thank you. That was an excellent response. I am sensitive to folks' time, uh, so I want to move on. Um, though I, maybe, Patrick, you can keep it tight. I'll let you have the last word from the faculty members. And the quick question is, what are uh, short, brief, closing words of advice to prospective students interested in doing a PhD at the iSchool? 30 seconds or less. Go. Yeah, okay, so I would... Frankly, you know, be reach out to the faculty members you think you want to work with. Um, and 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 since we're about to segue into the students, and I I really do tell all prospective students this. It's not just a coincidence that we're we're having you speak to the students. Talk to the students. Talk to the students who just graduated from from the program and who are in the program. Ask them what their experience has been like. Um, to ask about things like placement records and what different kinds of jobs people have gotten. Um, and you'll want to compare those um, responses um, to different programs. Thank you. And, okay, uh, so thank you very much to our faculty panel. So thank you very much, Shara, or Sarah. Thank you, Patrick, and thank you, Castis, for sharing your wisdom. Um, you're welcome to stay up until the students do their panel, or you can uh, head off. I, I know that uh, you have other commitments. So thank you again very much. Uh, for your time. I'll pass it over to uh, Sherry now. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Awesome. Yes, we can hear you. Yep. Thank you. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Sherry, uh, part of the student services team at the Faculty of Information. Uh, and today, I'm going to be talking about a little bit more nitty-gritty details on the admission requirements. Uh, but before I do, I just wanted to introduce uh, other members of the student services team here with us. Uh, first is Christine Chan, our assistant registrar. Uh, Tony mentioned her previous, briefly just now. Um, she provides main administrative support and coordination for our doctoral program and students. Uh, she's an extremely, extremely valuable resource for our doctoral students when it comes time to take a look at academic regulations, policies, of course, along with our PhD director and your supervisor. Um, the second member of the, of the student services team here 
uh, with us today is Andrea. She's our recruitment and admissions officer. Uh, the reason we are able to chat with you today is precisely because of her hard work. So thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Christine. Um, all that to say is uh, once you arrive on campus, you will have a very much dedicated team behind you, supporting you um, and walking along this journey with you. So let's begin. Let's take a look at our admission requirements. Thank you, Andrea. Um, so you can see here from the slide that our admission requirements are divided in all, into all of these various sections. Uh, the first one being your academic record. Uh, we're looking for a minimum, obviously, for a master's degree. Uh, looking for a minimum of an A minus or an equivalent for consideration. Um, if you're uh, if you obtained your previous degree from a non-Canadian institution, uh, we do have an international degree equivalency tool that you can click into on our website when you look at our PhD application requirements on our website. Uh, so just do take a look, poke around it. Um, an A minus or an equivalent for consideration. Uh, this is our minimum GPA requirement. Um, of course, presenting it doesn't guarantee admissions, um, but that's not, that's something that we're looking for. Um, many of you do come in with work experience. Um, unfortunately, we have to say, although work experience is extremely valuable, uh, but it cannot be used to substitute academic requirements. Uh, next will be transcripts. Um, when you do complete our online application, um, you don't have to provide us with official transcripts. It typically takes a while for official transcripts to trickle through, and we know it could be a source of stress for our applicants. So you don't have to provide us with official. You can just upload a PDF um, of your institution transcript. If and when you do receive an offer, um, it will be a conditional offer dependent on us receiving the official transcript at that point of time. Uh, and an official transcript does have to be sent to us from your home institution. So you can make that arrangement at that point, but you don't have to stress about it at the time of the application phase. Of course, your curriculum vitae, resume, uh, awards, volunteer experience, any teaching experience, uh, professional career, extracurricular activities, any cool projects you might have done. Um, it's a give us give us that good laundry list of all of your achievements, major, minor achievements. Research statement, uh, something that has been talked about quite a bit during the faculty panel. Uh, it does form a very important part of your application. Uh, it's 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 where it's it's what is your question uh, that you want to answer in with your PhD? Uh, what is it that you're curious about? Uh, how will this faculty? How will this faculty and potential supervisor get you to where you want to go? What is so important about this faculty for you in your journey? Uh, research statements we're looking for should be in a format with a maximum of 1500 words. Um, do reach out to our faculty members, do uh, email them, uh, set up an appointment, chat with them more about their research. How does that align with uh, your area of research? Uh, what is it that what kind of expertise can they bring uh, into your PhD journey? Uh, in your statement, you may want to include some of the following, like describing your research interests and direction uh, and how they align with the Faculty of Information Research Environment. Um, highlight anything in your education and professional background that is relevant to these interests, academic or industry research, and of course, potential supervisors that you want to work with. Um, we would like to see from your research statement that you have done some due diligence in researching the faculty and talk to some potential supervisors. Another part that has been talked about a little bit uh, during the faculty panel is also your writing sample. Um, you will be reading a lot and you'll be writing a lot uh, in your doctoral journey. So we would like to see a writing sample that you might have had previously, your original academic work, approximately 5,000 to 10,000 words. Uh, examples could be a little snippet of your previous thesis or a major research paper that you might have done in your, in your previous degree, uh, an article that you submitted for publication, or a chapter of a book, or any other similar publications. 
finally, we come to academic references. Uh, we are looking for three academic letters. Uh, you do have the option to do two to provide two more optional ones if you want to. Uh, it's not compulsory. Three is more than enough. Um, if you graduated more than five years ago, um, you know, you might have lost touch with some of your professors previously. Um, you could use work references. Um, you could ask, uh, you can ask your direct supervisor to provide a reference as well, but we do ask um, that you let your referees know to speak a little bit more to skill sets that might be useful in the academic environment, such as research skills, communication skills, writing skills. Uh, on the online application, you will be asked to provide contact information for your referees on the yeah, you'll be asked to provide contact information for your referees. And once you have made the application payment, an email will be sent directly to your referees to, um, to provide their reference. Okay, so everything happens on the background uh, once you have paid. For students where English is not your first language or um, you did not complete your previous degree in, a, um, in an institution where English is used as a teaching medium, uh, you have to provide English proficiency test results. Um, the specific test results you have to provide um, can be found on our website as well. Okay, last important piece, uh, very much aware of the time. Um, December 1st is the deadline for our online application. Um, for students that might have checked our website early on in the summer, uh, we had a slightly different deadline. So just keep in mind, we did bring forward our deadline for this year a little bit to December 1st. Um, the purpose of which is to make sure we are able to provide an, as early as a decision as possible for our potential for our applicants as well. Um, so just remember December 1st, we'll, you will need to have completed your online application, uh, pay the application fee, and submitted your research statement. December 15th will be when everything else is due, so you have a little bit more time to upload your transcripts, CV, writing sample, and also for your references, uh, and also for your referees to turn in the references as well. So do remember um, to let your referees know to uh, ahead of time that December 15th is the ultimate deadline for them to submit their part. Right. Um, that's all my little spiel. Um, we'll have question and answer later on as well. So happy to answer any questions later. Thank you, everyone. OK. Um, <laughs> Sherry, am I doing funding or? Oh. Um... I wasn't aware I was doing funding. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, or is it better for Christine or me? Did you want me to to take it? Sure. sure. Party on. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> okay. Um, so just uh, uh, briefly, basically, so the Faculty of Information does provide competitive funding packages for all full-time PhD students. So if you are admitted to the program, you will receive a full funding package. And it is intended to promote scholarly excellence, research, and teaching development in a time and timely completion of the program. Um, so what that funding includes is um, your tuition cost is covered for um, four years. And then you are able to, for the fifth year, um, based on um, on your, your progress so far, um, you could request um, or apply for uh, the cover the tuition uh, for the fi a fifth year as well. Um, but essentially, you get your tuition covered for um, the full um, full years, and then um, you get additional funding as well. Um, usually, um, an additional fifteen to seventeen thousand dollars, and those sources of funding are, are either through a fellowship, grant, and award, either a research assistantship or a teaching assistantship. Um, so that's how your funding. Um, package essentially works. So you'll get a little bit of extra money there to help um, with additional costs above uh, tuition as well. That makes sense. Thanks, Andrea. Uh, Haley and uh, student panel, um, I'm realizing I think I goofed on the agenda. Um, Q&A is actually after the student panel and discussion, but I 
if, if you're okay to stay a little bit late, sorry about this. I wonder if it would make sense to answer some of the questions that I see are just sort of like technical uh, how to apply uh, before we uh, turn it over to kind of you can <laughs> give the uh, potential applicants the straight goods. Is that okay, Haley? Okay, I see a thumbs up. All right, and from Jack too. Thank you. Sorry for making you all stay a little late. I see Jack and Ellen have been answering many of the questions in line. Um, there were two questions that I saw earlier that uh, this is for Sherry. Sherry, Olivia asks, um, my MSLS program was pass fail. How is that interpreted with the minimum A minus GPA requirement? I think that's fine. Uh, if that is the grading scale of your institution and your degree requirements, uh, we'll take it as such um, and we'll review it accordingly as part of your entire portfolio. Um, one thing that I should have mentioned, I think I forgot, is um, academic requirements is part of the application package. However, it's not the it's we, we do not use it as a filter uh, to filter out applications per se. Um, the the PhD admissions committee they do look through they do review all the applications all the full applications that were submitted so if your program if your previous program is being created on a pass fail scale so be it <laughs> we'll review it accordingly okay uh, if you could stay on Sherry uh, a few more yeah. questions for you uh, these are a couple from Maria uh, one can referee emails be from Gmail or should they come from the institution um mm. and yeah. oh and uh, do you accept those recommendation letters sent via post <laughs> okay I, I do see maria's question there so i respond to those uh in turn um can referee emails be from gmail uh it's the system really doesn't like it um the email address should be coming from an institute email um so we really prefer it to be um utoronto.ca, mcgill.ca, it has to be an institution email will be preferred. Uh, oh, I think, and are we able to submit more than one writing sample? Um, PDF it into one big document um, because it only has one upload slot. So you will have to PDF it um, to upload just one document. It should be within the 5,000 to 10,000 word range though. And the deadline for the research statement is December 1st. Okay. Christina has a question there and then Blair near the bottom too. Christina's question is, can we submit one of our assignments as a, as a writing sample? Yes. Yeah. Uh, a, a research paper that you wrote in your, in your master's level course. Um, yes, please submit that. Um, I think I missed Zewin's question. On can, can you accept recommendation letters by post? Yes, we can. Oh, yeah. Um, we absolutely can. So what we'll do is we'll receive it by post and we'll scan it and upload it into your application portal. Um, that's fine. Um, it, it does take a while, <laughs> um, especially if the lockdown situation still is still ongoing. Um, well, actually, yeah, by the time you submit your application, uh, the lockdown situation is still, in fact, ongoing. Um, so it's not a good idea to actually submit by post. Yeah. Can I just add if you if you, if they are going to be submitting it um, like through an email, for example, it has to come directly from them. So they can't. Yes. It can't ever like be like in your hands. Um, so if they're sending it like, to admissions.iSchool, for example, then it has to come directly from that referee. And so safe. And then also just back to the email address, if. Um, if say like your professor that someone you're getting a uh, reference from has retired and they no longer have an institutional email, um, then yes, you are still able to put a non-institutional email address in the system. Yeah, great. Uh, one, a couple questions from uh, Blair about uh, writing sample, can it be published work? I think the answer to that is yes. And the second question is, can it be a co-authored piece of work? Uh, Sherry or Andrea, do you want to speak to that? Um, because it's uh, it, it's a piece of work that needs to speak to your writing capabilities, um, so it should not be co-authored. Okay, and then Christina Sam has a question uh, from a raised hand. Christina, if you want to unmute yourself. 
Sure. Thank you so much, Tony. Thank you, Sherry. And um, so my question is: um, some of us are not in the easy stream, so we taking coursework, coursework project. And the question I asked earlier with regards to assignments. So we in the high school we write like so many. We do a lot of assignments, some ten pages, some twenty pages, and all that. Can we submit one of those assignments like two thousand words or three thousand? At a limit, anyway. But can we submit one of those assignments as um, our writing sample plus our research statement? Or it should be like an article or, yeah, kind of project. Yep, Christina, that's totally fine. Um, if your writing sample, if one writing sample is around 2,000 characters, um, maybe you will provide two writing samples that are put together one PDF to be uploaded. Um, yeah, but that's totally fine. OK. I, uh, OK. I think, OK, so it looks like there's sort of one more question about just sort of the running of the program and whether it was only, I, I sorry, I clicked away. I can't find the chat anymore. Can you speak to it? Sherry? Yes, so Maria's question is, um, I understand that the PhD is full time. I'm a single working parent and curious about session timings. Do classes typically run in the evenings? I run into evenings or am I able to select morning classes? Um, it really depends, Maria. We are unable to guarantee or make sure that classes are in the mornings or afternoons or evenings. It does kind of happen sporadically throughout the day and it it's it also dependent on instructor availabilities as well. Um, I would say there are morning classes, there are afternoon classes, and there are evening classes. The good news about the PhD program, however, is um, you're probably taking a very small handful of classes each semester. Um, so you're able, hopefully able to adjust your personal schedule accordingly. Um, based on uh based on what schedule your particular course happens to be that specific term okay thank you for those uh, i see zwen has one more question in the chat i'm going to um ask that maybe sherry respond to these uh, uh perhaps by email or maybe in the chat as uh sure. otherwise i want to not uh hold the phd students uh, uh too far beyond kind of the time that they committed to be here um, so I just wanted to say from uh, as the PhD director, you've now heard a, a little bit about the program and about the admissions process. Uh, you've heard from it from sort of the official official way. Um, and uh, the idea with this next panel uh, of students that's going to be led by Haley Bryant here um, is that you can get the straight goods from the students that are in the program and the students that have just kind of finished out of the program. So. Uh, my suggestion to all of you is to be open and as frank, good, bad, ugly as you can. I think that that is uh, useful for everybody to hear. Um, I'm going to stop the recording in a moment, uh, and then I will I will take off. Uh, the one thing that I will add um, is that I there the, the the university to some extent is operating on the assumption. Uh, and this is about the COVID situation. The university is operating sort of not like completely yet, um, but you know, you're thinking about what life is like in September, right? I think the university is operating with the assumption that we are going to need to continue to live with this COVID situation to some extent uh, for a couple years on. Um, and so uh, Ellen uh, is a brand new student, uh, first year, uh, whatever it is, like two months in, I guess, um, who's been able to sort of start in this COVID situation. And so probably a good question to ask her is, what is it like to start a PhD when I may not be able to see my cohort in a meaningful way? OK, yeah, it's weird. <laughs> OK, so thank you very much. Uh, let me see if I can figure out how to stop the recording.